Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a great break, got to stretch your legs a little bit. Thank you for attending our second session, Understanding the Public Perspective. My name is Connie Arevalo. I'm a research scientist at Phonolytics. I'm very excited to present the first speaker of this session, Willem Slagers, a senior behavioral scientist at Rethink Priorities, who will discuss his work on measuring people's attitudes toward wild animal suffering. Hi, my name is William Slagers. I'm a senior behavioral scientist at Rethink Priorities, and I'd like to give you some takeaways from some work that we've conducted on the topic of wild animal welfare. So what I want to do is I want to start with a brief introduction of wild animal welfare, then a very brief overview of the work we've done, and then the takeaways. So first, wild animal welfare. So there are three points that I want to focus on. One is that wild animals suffer on an enormous scale. So they suffer from dehydration, starvation, diseases, physical injuries from a variety of sources like weather conditions, uh, natural disasters, but also other animals. Like for example, this bird, it's a cowbird and they uh, lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And then they check if they're actually taking care of their egg. And if not, they kill everybody in the nest. And that to me is just insane and just one of the like atrocities that just happen in nature. And that is really what it is about. Like it's about looking at nature and seeing that actually a lot of bad things happen because you might have this sort of like idyllic view of nature or not really have thought about it much. But if you do and you sort of like see through this veil and you see like, oh, wow, that's a lot of bad things happening. Now, this veil has not been lifted for everybody, and so it uh, might actually be considered also a neglected issue where not a lot of people see this as a problem, uh, which is unfortunate because there are also things that we can do about it. Um, there are shelters we can build, we can help animals during natural disasters, or just help them in certain times of need, uh, or implement vaccination programs. So there are many things that we could do to help alleviate uh, some of the suffering of some animals. And so part of the goal of wild animal welfare uh, activism and research is to try and get more people on board with this perspective. Now, we thought we could contribute uh, to this endeavor by creating a scale to measure people's attitudes towards wild animal welfare, because we think this has several benefits. It allows us to, one, understand people's attitudes. So do they support or oppose wild animal welfare, or uh, it can support also outreach. So if you know better what people think, this can also, of course, guide outreach. Um, and also it can build the field. So if you have this tool available for others to use, then they can use it and also end up doing more research on this topic and really putting um, wild animal welfare on the map. Now, we specifically set out to measure four things. We wanted to measure to what extent people care about wild animals, to what extent they think we should intervene, because that's distinct from also just caring, um, their idyllic views of nature, and whether they think that uh, interventions are actually effective, whether we can do something. Well, we conducted um, multiple studies on this. Uh, we started off by just creating a bunch of items. We then conducted pilot studies uh, to help narrow down which items we can use. And then we conducted large-scale factor analysis studies uh, where we really tossed a lot of data uh, at the problem. And after three of those studies, we made a selection of which items we think constitutes our scale. And then we confirmed that in a fourth uh, confirmatory study, which replicated our findings. So we're quite excited about that. All, available, all the materials are available and we're currently writing up the manuscript aiming to uh, submit it for publication in an academic journal. So that brings us to the takeaways. And the first one is we found that respondents actually seem to care about wild animals. So here's an example item that we used. Um, I care about wild animals that are in pain, no matter whether their suffering is due to human or natural causes. And on the right, you can see the agreement. Uh, there's quite some agreement. We see that it ranges from like somewhat to even strongly agree. And this was quite surprising, potentially, like especially if you approach this topic from that neglected side, like you think that people don't see this as an issue and therefore they really won't care. 
Uh, it doesn't seem to be true. People do care about wild animals. Maybe they won't care about certain specifics or know what to do about certain cases, but I think just in general, we seem to show that people actually do care, which I think was an interesting uh, finding. We also see it when it comes to interventions. So it's not as the agreement is not as strong as with just caring in general, but we also see quite some support for um, yeah support for interventions. So here's another example item: uh, humans should take steps to try and reduce the suffering of wild animals, even when that suffering is entirely due to natural causes. Also here we see quite some agreement, not as much as before, but. If you really think that people just don't care about wild animals, you would expect much more disagreement here. And we actually see more than that, I think. Uh, it does depend on the intervention. So we also asked some uh, about some really specific interventions like providing for basic needs and uh, vaccinating and treating injured animals. For those, we really see a lot of agreement, like lots of support. Um, but for others, not so much. Like for genetic manipulation, people <laughs> were like, no. <laughs> That's probably not a good idea. But uh, the others, actually, as you can see, quite a lot of support, which is quite uh, interesting and motivating. Now, the third takeaway is regarding the idyllic view of nature. So we included the idyllic view of nature as a thing that we wanted to measure because it's often cited as a reason for why people might not care or think we shouldn't intervene. And the reasoning being, if you think that nature is this paradise, this really great place, then why should you uh, intervene and why would you care uh, if they're so great off? And what we find is that uh, we don't actually find <laughs> this relationship. So if this would be true, you would expect that the more people think that the lives of wild animals are great, the less you should intervene. So we should find like a negative slope here. But instead, we see this somewhat positive slope, meaning that if you score higher on viewing nature as a place where animals live good lives, they actually think, oh, does, we should intervene and actually care a bit more. So we don't find support for this common idea that it's this paradise view of nature that explains uh, potential uh, neglect for the issues of wild animal welfare. Then the fourth takeaway, uh, it was very nice to see that um, our measure of caring about wild animals also predicted uh, donation behavior. So we gave our respondents some extra money and they could donate it to one of three charities or they could keep it for themselves. And we saw that, um, you can see it in the graph as well, if you score higher on caring about wild animals, so go from left to right in this graph, then this increases the probability that you will donate the bonus to the Wild Animal Initiative, which is the blue dashed line. So you can see that the probability goes up. Uh, this was very nice for us because it supports our measure. Like it's a validation test, like this measuring what we wanted to measure. And I think it's also interesting to know that if you have an opportunity to measure people's attitudes towards uh, wild animal welfare, that you can then also expect this to be related to their donation behavior. And then five, the final takeaway um, is that measuring attitudes towards wild animal welfare is hard. So there were quite some challenges that we faced. Um, one interesting one was that initially we asked people about, like, how do you care about wild animals suffering? And a lot of people were like, yes, because we screwed up their lives. So they blamed humans for a lot of the suffering that wild animals face. While we were more interested in people's uh, opinion regarding natural sources of harm. So we really had to um, adapt the items, make sure that we're referring to natural sources of harm just so that people would also consider that and not just think that, oh yeah, no, it's just, we suck, we should help them. So this was a very interesting uh, finding. Um, of course, we asked these very general questions, but obviously it depends on specifics like there are so many different animal species out there and so it kind of depends maybe maybe some for some species you care more than for other species um, depending on whether they can feel pain or pleasure same for interventions you might support certain interventions but not others so there's a lot of it depends to it while we stayed in this sort of like general range we just wanted to have like a general assessment and so that also creates some issues and definitely made it a bit more complicated for respondents to sometimes answer the questions 
statistically speaking, it was also quite challenging for us because really we were really driven to do a really great job here and use up-to-date um, statistical techniques to make sure that our measure is appropriate. Um, but the current scientific norms were actually not that great, and we had to do a lot of heavy lifting ourselves to try and understand what the best approaches here are. So it's not easy to just make like a scale and uh, expect it to all work out very well. All right, those were my five uh, takeaways. If you want to know more, of course, feel free to ask your questions during the Q&A. Um, but if you want to contact me, there's my email address. I can give you more sad facts about wild animals, for instance, um, or just talk about the research. And thanks to my colleagues who helped on this project. And of course, thank you for your attention. Alrighty, thank you so much for that really interesting presentation, Willem. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, they seem to be coming in quite a bit. All right, so we'll go with the first one. Um, Anna asks, could you say more about the underlying framework used to guide when to intervene in wild animal suffering? For example, what about wild animals hurting each other? Yes, thanks so much for that question. Um... I, I can partially answer that very quickly by just saying there is no good framework for determining that. Um, but what uh, is very clear is that according to this perspective of looking at wild animal suffering, it is a problem. Like we do consider it a problem that um, animals suffer due to other animals, but the issue of predation um, is definitely an issue. Or the example of the bird that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is also bad. <laughs> like these are um, some creatures inflicting harm on other creatures. And we take this sort of like suffering focused uh, perspective of determining whether we think this is a problem or not. And that's why we think it's a problem. Uh, whether we then think we should intervene, um, there, there are only some ideas out there as to what can maybe be done, but there are no actual interventions yet to really deal with these issues. Um, there are some ideas of like genetic editing to make um, certain predators basically vegetarian. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a little bit of like a sci-fi idea, but there are some people seriously thinking about that. Um, but then even with those kinds of suggestions, we run into issues of like, okay, but then how will that affect the larger ecosystem? Um, which we don't know. So basically that means like we need to do more research. So the point is look at this as a problem, uh, start getting more people on board on seeing this as a problem, do more research on it and look at possible ways to intervene in the future. Not yet, because we're not ready yet. I hope that answers the question. That was great. <laughs> um, let's go to another question. We have a question from Melina. Wes, do you think your findings reflect a history of conservation as a motivation for helping wild animals? Um, so interestingly, there has been a lot of work already on attitudes towards uh, wild animals, um, although they tend to refer to it as wildlife. And that is generally from a conservation slash environmentalist uh, background. Um, so that, that is partially about uh, conservation, uh, because that is, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. They did a lot of research on um, the public to see what their values are towards wild animals, uh, because we have been having wildlife related issues, like how should we interact with wildlife? Should we try and preserve certain species? How shall we de deal with the conflicts that inevitably arise between humans and wildlife? So they asked people already a lot about um, their attitudes towards wild animals, but then Indeed, it is this background of environmentalism and conservation, um, which is very distinct from the perspective that we are using, which is that it's about the individual wild animals and it's about whether they are suffering or not, and not so much just preserving their species or um, alternatively that the motivations are still ultimately about that of human interests, uh, which a lot of wildlife management issues are really about. So a lot of the work that has been done already does come from that uh, background, yes. 
Great, thank you. Um, well, that's all the time that we have for questions, um, but if you do wanna continue the discussion, please wait until the end of the session to go into a breakout room with all the speakers from the session. So we're going to be joined now by Devin Dougherty, an animal advocate with a master's degree in human-animal interactions, who will present her master's research on the psychology of egg and dairy consumption. Hi, my name is Devin Dougherty, and today I'm going to be presenting the research that I did with Dr. Carol Jasper. And the name of my talk today is The Cheese Paradox, The Psychology of Egg and Dairy Consumption in Vegetarians. So this research sprang out of reflection upon my own time as a vegetarian for many years before going vegan, but here's some theoretical background as well. So over the years, much attention has been paid to the psychological dimensions of meat consumption. We now know about the meat paradox, which is psychological discomfort arising from people's affinity for animals, their desire not to harm animals, and the conducting desire to consume animal flesh. But what can be said about the psychology of consuming an animal's non-meat products and in an age where most beings bred for these industries are harmed and ultimately killed? So unlike meat, the psychological processes involved in egg and dairy consumption are currently unexplored. And our study aimed to address this gap we interviewed vegetarians and we analysed their responses via thematic analysis. And that is just analysing the data for recurring themes. And like I mentioned earlier, we chose vegetarians as, as our sample population because they are more likely to show empathetic concern for animals than meat eaters, and yet they also choose to consume eggs and dairy, which is a conflict ripe for exploration. So why is this important? Well, animals in the egg and dairy industries have the same negative experiences as those bred for the meat industry. And cattle welfare experts have even rated dairy cows as substantially more likely to experience negative welfare than beef cows. And a similar study has not been done yet comparing egg laying hens to chickens bred for meat, but it's likely that they would have the same outcome because these animals, they suffer a longer period of exploitation than animals raised for meat before arriving at the slaughterhouse. And while vegetarians eat a lot of these products, research shows that they obtain more of their daily calories from cheese, eggs and yogurt than any other dietary group and eat almost double the amount of cheese than meat eaters. And yet literature exploring vegetarians' motivations focuses entirely on the exclusion of meat rather than the inclusion of these non-meat animal products. So there was definitely a gap in the literature. So here is a highly condensed summary of our findings, which I'll talk you through. All participants expressed ethical concern about animals in egg and dairy industries, which is the subject of our first theme, Acknowledging Harm. One participant said, you don't associate these products with the death of the animal, but ultimately it's all part of the process which is finished with the death of the animal. And the key takeaway for this theme is that all participants acknowledged harm and even death to animals in egg and dairy production, but found it easier to simply forgo meat which carried a bigger moral weight than eating an animal's secretions. So if vegetarians feel morally conflicted about consuming these products, then what motivates them to continue doing so? Well, we found a wide range of personal and social factors. The personal benefits of eating eggs and dairy included taste, convenience and nutrition. One interviewee said, I feel like I'd rather be part of the solution than the problem, but cheese is addictive, milk is cheap, eggs are tasty and yogurt is good for you. And the key takeaway was the consumption of eggs and dairy acts as a compromise of participants' values, a way to minimise their role in ethically questionable practices while reaping personal benefits. The social norms which influenced participants' consumption of these products included a desire to fit in and preserve social harmony, to reduce or avoid conflict, to assimilate with culture norms, and the avoidance of stigma, especially the stigmatisation of veganism and vegan alternatives. 
One participant said, I think most people would have an understanding of why meat would be such a big no-go, but I think people wouldn't be as receptive or understanding of why you wouldn't want to eat cheese. And the key takeaway is participants' vegetarianism acted as a trade-off in the sense that the inclusion of eggs and dairy in social settings acted as a compromise between the values of avid meat eaters and vegetarians within social groups. And our final theme was neutralising dissonance, which explored the possibility of cognitive dissonance and the ways in which participants seem to reduce conflict or discomfort about their consumption of eggs and dairy. So a few of the strategies that we observed is perceived ignorance of ethical issues, confirmation bias in regards to humane or free range of farming practices and utilitarianism which is basically weighing up the benefits vis the drawbacks of consuming these products. One participant said, I mean, sometimes in my head, I'm just like, yeah, I don't agree with how some of the stuff's produced, but sometimes I just ignore it. And the key takeaway is that participants likely experience cognitive dissonance related to their egg and dairy consumption and use various strategies to reduce associated discomfort, which facilitates their continued consumption of these products. So now I wanted to move on to suggestions for advocacy. One finding was that taste, convenience and nutrition are the main personal benefits which motivate vegetarians to eat eggs and dairy. And a lot of people spoke about not knowing how to get adequate nutrition from fully plant-based meals. So advocates should lobby the government to incorporate plant-based nutrition education into schools so that people have a formative knowledge of this and they don't go into adulthood thinking they need dairy for strong bones or eggs for calcium, as we've all been told at one point. They should also promote easy and direct swaps like scrambled tofu for scrambled eggs, nutritional yeast for parmesan and oat milk for cow's milk. Encourage plant-based manufacturers to ensure their products live up to the same taste and nutritional standards as animal products and lobby the government to subsidise plant-based agriculture rather than animal agriculture so that they become cheaper and more available for everyone. Vegetarians may be more likely than vegans to compromise their moral values for social acceptance, so advocates should focus on making veganism more socially acceptable, such as campaigns that subvert social norms and frame animal eaters as the outsiders really turn the tables and get people thinking about it in a different way. Encourage celebrity endorsement as long as it's not super problematic celebrities then it's generally a good idea and create and defend adverts with vegan messages for national tv for that visibility. Also lobby the government to make multiple vegan options a legal requirement in nurseries and schools, which unbelievably it's not yet. And lobby universities to make their menus plant-based and the Plant-Based Universities campaign are doing really great work on this. So if you're a university student, then get involved with them. Finally, vegetarians feel less guilty about consuming cheese than milk, which is quite a paradoxical finding because of course, cheese and milk come from the same source. But advocates should design campaigns which link cheese to the living animal and to fluid milk to tackle cognitive dissonance and trigger empathy for dairy cows. And disseminate facts specific to the harms of cheese, such as how 10 litres of cow's milk are needed to produce just one kilogram of cheese. So even more animals are harmed in the making of cheese than milk, it creates more demand for milk. A few more suggestions for animal advocacy. I think it's reasonable to link eggs and dairy to feminist values. So the dairy industry and the egg industry rely on exploitation of the female reproductive system. Bring attention to little known issues with eggs because knowledge about that was lagging a little bit behind dairy. So you can highlight some less known things such as how taking eggs from chickens prevents them pre from performing natural behaviors like incubation. And try to keep your advocacy evidence-based and rational. So instead of saying free range is a lie, try, did you know that free range requirements for eggs gives chickens less living space than two A4 sheets of paper? And also it may be beneficial to portray cheese and eggs in a way which makes them appear less familiar and or disgusting, which makes people want to eat them less. 
So thank you so much for listening. My email is down the bottom and you can read our full paper in the journal Appetites. Thank you for that really insightful presentation, Devin. So let's jump into some questions. Um, we have a question from Mona. She wants to know, regarding one of the recommendations, how do we effectively encourage plant-based manufacturers to improve the nutrition and quality of their products, especially cheese? Has this been studied? Hi, um, hope you can hear me okay, and thanks for the question. Um, I'm not aware if this has been studied. Um, definitely something to look at, but personally I would say like, give brands feedback. I think it's okay to say this vegan cheese is crap. I think it's it's okay not just to promote brands because they are vegan, because at the end of the day, if they're not high quality, then they're not going to be convincing people in the long term. Um, so I think, yeah, just, just being honest and giving feedback to brands about their products, um, whether that's emailing them, commenting on their their socials um yeah just engaging with them in, in social media um I think they're always open to receiving that feedback and um another good thing is like there's there's a few apps coming out like a billion for example where you, where you can review vegan food and um I would encourage you to get involved in that as well because you know the more reviews there are about something we can work out what the better products are and yeah just really just really trying to um, engage with them to the fullest because I think they'll be really open to hearing consumer feedback. Thank you for that. Um, sorry, just sh sifting through the questions here. Um, let's see. We have a comment here. You're phrasing about plant-based products living up to the same nutritional standards as animal-based ones sort of implies that animal products are intrinsically superior and set the bar. I'm struggling to think of better wording, but maybe something like are at least as nutritious as. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. That's a really great point. Um, I'm trying to think what I had in mind specifically um, is when I suppose vegan, let's say, vegan cheeses for example now we know that dairy is, is bad for us and we don't need it but obviously it does have things like um, calcium and that vegan cheese might not naturally have so it'd be things like just making sure that um in that situation where it's more of a processed product and it's not a whole foods product with lots of nutrition where it's just you know some, some cheese that we want to slap on a burger because it tastes nice and um then I think in that situation, comparing it to the dairy-based version and saying, okay, well, let's fortify it with calcium or let's fortify it with whatever, just so that we can have a really robust defense for anyone that comes back and says, well, this product's it's not as good as this and it doesn't have these vitamins. And of course, on a whole foods plant-based diet, it will. Um, but with just with the more processed products, I suppose, um, that, you know, we do need and um, we need them to compete with the processed animal products um, and they're very delicious as well obviously um I just think it's good to make sure that we're encouraging fortification of those um but thanks that's really good feedback and I will take that on board awesome um we have another comment slash question here um I'm interested in the current increase in concern about vegan products being ultra processed compared to meat what are your thoughts yeah this is definitely a big thing lately and I think the thing to point out is that literally everything in this world is made of chemicals and if if animal, if manufacturers of animal-based foods were reported the same amount of detail that plant-based manufacturers did, you know, the, the list of ingredients would be far longer. It would have all the amino, amino acids, fatty chains, like all these different things. So I think that's one thing to point out that um, chemicals does not necessarily equal bad. Um, chemicals are the building blocks of everything. Um, and then... I suppose another thing to point out is like if it's a it's a vegan burger or a sausage, like people are generally not eating these for for health reasons. Um, they're eating them because they want a a, a burger or or a sausage. You know, people aren't eating those animal based versions for health. Um, it's really necessary for helping animals to have these direct easy swaps. Not everybody does care about health. And then I suppose the last thing is that if you look at a lot of studies, um, comparing 
uh, the animal based foods to the the plant based um alternatives, the plant based alternatives still come out on top in terms of health. Um, there was one I read recently that I'll be able to find and, and put in the chat, but the um the they put people on either the the processed plant foods or the processed animal based foods, and there was a drop in LDL cholesterol. There was a drop in um a lot of and disease markers so even though they're they're yes they're they're processed um doesn't equal doesn't necessarily equal bad and they can actually still come out on top um in terms of health so i think it's really just a matter of educating ourselves on this and having kind of good comebacks to that um but those are the thoughts that i have in my head just now but i would love to speak about this further because i'm really interested in it as well Absolutely. Thank you so much, Devin. Uh, that's all the time that we have for questions. Uh, once again, if you do want to continue the discussion, just please wait until the end of the session to go into a breakout room with all the speakers from the session. So up next, we have Anna Thomas, a computer science PhD student from Stanford University, who will present research on the impact of different vegan media on people's behaviors. Hi. My name is Anna Thomas, and I'll be presenting joint work with Jessica Hope and Maya Mother on the impact of vegan media on public awareness and consumption of plant-based food. And we're from the Stanford Human and Sustainable Food Lab. So in terms of the high-level motivation, when we look to history, we see a number of books, such as Uncle Tom's Cabin, Silent Spring, and The Feminine Mystique, that are widely viewed as playing a pivotal role in events like the Civil War and the end of slavery, as well as the rise of second wave feminism. Now turning to farmed animal advocacy. In the past few years, we've seen the release of a number of vegan media, like The Game Changers and What the Health. And there's a natural question of what impact these may have had, if any, and more generally, what the properties of impactful vegan media might be. This is an ongoing project we'll be presenting preliminary results from. In terms of data sources, we're using Google Trends, where we can examine searches for not only the documentaries themselves, but also keywords like vegan recipes, plant-based diet, et cetera. Of course, we also want to know to what extent people are actually buying animal products. So we're also using metrics of demand or purchase of animal-based products um, from KSU, um, their meat demand indices in particular, and the Nielsen scanner data set. In terms of methodology, we source candidate vegan media from a variety of sources with an initial list of 151 media. We apply a few specific rules in order to ensure a plant-based diet is a significant focus and to reduce the chance of spurious findings, we also want to focus on those that were popular as measured by Google search volume, rather than testing all of them. And uh, then the, the question of how do we actually assess a potential impact of these chosen media gets very interesting on a technical level. There are multiple approaches we've thought about here. And one is to actually use the continuous search volume for the media itself, such as game the, the phrase game changers or the phrase what the health as well as the outcome of interest, um, such as searches for vegan recipes, and essentially run a correlation to assess the synchrony of these time series. Are they going up and down at a, same, at a similar time? More precisely, uh, this takes the form of a multiple regression in which we also try to account for the time series structure, seasonal trends, um, and control for other relevant media. And that's what I'll be showing the results from here. Now we come to the results of our filtering process, which yielded six documentaries, uh, Forks Over Knives, Fat Sick and Nearly Dead, Cowspiracy, What the Health, and Game Changers. We did have some books in our original list, but interestingly, none of them passed our popularity criterion. Um, these, uh, these books included The Omnivore's Dilemma and um, The China Study uh, and others. Uh, so this could reflect an inherent disparity in popularity of books versus documentaries these days, um, or this could be a weakness of our metric that perhaps people are more likely to Google a title on Netflix than when they're browsing in a bookstore in person. Um, now just to describe a bit about the six selected media. So here's the popularity as measured by peak um, Google search volume. Uh, and so we can see here that Oak and What the Health are coming out ahead with Cowspiracy um, at the bottom. And uh, one thing to note is that Okja had a higher peak than What the Health, but then another metric is total search volume um, and some time frame after the release. And in, in the case of What the Health, this was actually 34% higher than Okja. Um, so there, there are different ways of, of, compu of you know, operationalizing and, and formalizing um, um, popularity based on Google alone. Uh, we can also look at the uh, content of the media on, um, 
uh, in our chosen set as well as in the initial list. So um, only one of our sources actually annotated um, the uh, starting set of media by the angle it was coming from. This is a list on Wikipedia. And in our, in, our, in our particular time frame, when we look at the breakdown of topics, we see that it was mostly ethics, 63% ethics, with also some health and then finally environment. Whereas in our final six, the most popular based on Google, uh, we see it was, it was health mainly, uh, four out of six, and then one of each of ethics and environment. Uh, of course, we can't claim any causal connection here that a health focus is the cause of the popularity of these films, but it's an interesting association that could perhaps be followed up on in randomized experiments of these media. Um, now we have the plot of the search volumes for each of these media and the outcome, which is vegan recipes. So there are a few things to note here. So number one, um, some media have a very sharp peak and decline. So one of these is Okja, um, also What the Health, around the same time. Whereas others have a slower decline, such as forks over knives and fat sick and nearly done. Um, also, the y-axis here is the Google search volume as a fraction of the peak uh, search volume, so it's all relative. Um, and um, the second thing to note here is that there's a holiday trend here, as shown by these vertical black lines every December. And um, so very clearly, there's a, um, an uptick in the Google searches for vegan recipes. We also found this with you know, recipes more generally around the holiday season. And this is something that's very important to control for. Otherwise, if we had a media that comes out around the holiday season, which was the case for Game Changers, we might actually overestimate um, any impact this documentary might have if we don't account for this holiday trend. Uh, number three, uh, we do have overlaps in timing for two pairs here. So this is Forks Over Knives and Fat Sick and Nearly Dead. Um, and particularly for What the Health and Oakja, this is uh, almost a 0.9 correlation here. So using our particular data sources and methodology, we really can't distinguish. Um, was this uptick in vegan recipes around this time period? Was this due to Oakja or What the Health? We, we really can't say. And we'll come back to this in later slides as well. Uh, so now moving on to the initial results with searches for vegan recipes as the outcome. So we tried out three different methods for adjusting for the holiday effect. And we're taking a conservative approach of only considering a particular media to be significant if it was significant in all three approaches. Um, so for testing the methods themselves, we used some negative control tests like Taylor Swift albums, uh, in particular 1999, or 1989, Red and Reputation which we wouldn't expect to have any impact on vegan recipe searches, and also replaced vegan recipes as the outcome with others like Hippo, Toe, and Bicycle, which we wouldn't expect to be impacted by these documentaries. And the good news is that um, all three methods passed all of the 24 negative control tests, which is a good validation. Um, and the main finding here is that Oak and What the Hell, um, their significance was robust to all variations of the analysis we tried, which lends credence to there really being some association here, uh, which is not the case for the other four documentaries. Um, so the main point here is that um, with our analysis, there are always choices that can be made. This is also called the garden of forking pads. And we're taking a more conservative approach of um, only highlighting as significant ones that were significant across these you know, three reasonable choices for handling the trend. Um, and uh, in terms of the others, so cowspiracy was actually never significant in any approach. Um, and it was also the least popular um, based on Google metrics. For Forks Over Knives, Game Changers, and What the Health, um, and fat, uh, sorry, for Forks Over Knives, Game Changers, and Fat Sick and Nearly Dead, it depended on the specific method. So uh, for each of those it were significant in at least one, um, but not all. Um, and going back to these, this plot, this is also consistent with what we see visually. There's, you know, really prominent jump here with Oak Gen, what the hell, and this did not occur during the holiday time. So this uh, cannot, is, is, you know, unlikely to be attributed to the standard holiday effect. Um, game changers and then this, you know, 2011 pair, forks over knives, fat, sick, and nearly dead. There may be an uptick here, um, but it's, you know, more subtle, um, sorry, it's um, more subtle than the, 27, the um, June 2017 peak. Then the Game Changers, again, there seems to be uh, an uptick, but again, this is around the holiday season, so it gets a little bit muddled. So hard to be confident there. So before moving on to the recommendations for animal advocates, uh, we do want to highlight a couple of limitations of our approach, which we plan to reduce in our ongoing work. Uh, of course, our outcome is limited in that we're not capturing actual behavior, um, but simply searches for vegan recipes. Uh, and, and this will, you know, it's, it's, it's a limited outcome, certainly. And this will be addressed in our ongoing work. Um, we're thinking of adding not only, you know, perhaps, um, you know, other 
other outcomes on social media, but also, you know, concretely, you know, what was the demand or purchase of animal-based products. Um, and it's also very important to note that we cannot prove causality here. There may have been some unknown event, um, like, you know, a prominent public figure going vegan, press on PETA investigations in, you know, June 2017, that increased interest in veganism. We've certainly tried our best to look into other possible events, but, you know, there may be something we're missing. And the association with What the Health in Oakton may just be a coincidence. So all we can really say is that there is an association. Uh, we cannot assess causality using these data sources. Uh, but of course, if anyone knows of uh, other data sources, then I'll get back to this um, later. We would be very interested in talking further. Um, so, so now to conclude with the recommendations for animal advocates, um, so our evidence, we, we obviously want it to be measured here, but we also do want to highlight what, what we uh, found. Our evidence is consistent with an impact of uh, at least some pro-vegan documentaries on search behavior related to adoption of a vegan diet with what the health coming from a health focus in Okja, which humanizes a pig and highlights the animal suffering associated with factory farms, showing a significant association. Uh, again, we, we uh, cannot distinguish between the two. So one recommendation is that we think that further study of both methodology for evaluating media interventions and the characteristics of impactful vegan media is warranted given the various methodological issues that arise here. And a more concrete one is that we strongly encourage creators of pro-vegan media like documentaries to consult with statisticians in order to try to collect data to quantify the impact. Uh, we think it'll be very powerful for the field in the long run. But we can establish a reliable knowledge base of the characteristics of these impactful interventions and it's fascinating because it really goes back to some fundamental questions about human nature. Uh, is it the self-centered motivations like health that are the most impactful or more altruistic motivations like animal suffering or the environment? Um, as this is an ongoing project, we would greatly uh, welcome any feedback or questions from anyone here or suggestions on additional data which could shape our research direction or any clarifying questions. Um, and just to say a little bit about this lab, this is an interdisciplinary uh, lab at Stanford which brings together people with technical backgrounds in stats and machine learning with those with backgrounds in nutrition and psychology, um, all united by the goal of accelerating society's transition to a humane and sustainable food system. So thank you to the Food Systems Research Fund for being one of our sponsors and thanks to you for your attention. Thank you for that really great presentation, Anna. I'm seeing so much love in the chat for Taylor appearing in your presentation. Um, so we're now joined by Anna and her colleague, Jessica, for the Q&A. So let's take a look at these questions. Let's see. So we have a question from Susan who asks, do you find the vegan chefs on TV are helping to mainstream a plant-based diet? Um, yeah, so, so we actually didn't in incorporate these uh, vegan chefs uh, into our analysis. Uh, we were actually focusing on documentaries and books in particular. But yeah, I think that could be a great avenue for future work potentially, um, especially if these, um, yeah, if anyone had suggestions on particular vegan chefs, uh, we could potentially incorporate that into our ongoing work. So I'll just put uh, my email into the chat in case anyone wants to um, send me specific pointers. But yeah, that and yeah, I think there was also a comment on the vegetarian epicure, um, coincidentally by someone with the same name as me. And yeah, that yeah, I, I think that was in the in the nineteen seventies, and that was also associated with the rise of veganism. So with our Google Trends based approach, um, this is two thousand four onwards. So yeah, um, with their current data sources, that's kind of outside of the scope of this particular study. Uh, and of course, there's you know Peter Singer's work. So so um, really, there there's so much that kind of goes into shifting people's perceptions and behaviors. So. Um, in, in order to say something kind of quantitative and precise, we have to kind of limit the scope of what we're doing here. But yeah, we're, we're very interested in taking a holistic approach. Um, and yeah, so so please feel free to contact me with, with other suggestions for what to look into. Awesome. Um, just a quick question before we move on. Um, what do you see as uh, next steps in your research? What do you see as high priority here? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so we're actually trying to partner with Netflix um, and in other streaming services because I think that would be ideal. Is to really, yeah, I think on the methodological side, there there's a lot that we we can do further. So, I, I mean, I've seen a variety of you know randomized controlled experiments, kind of head to head messaging studies. Um, well, you know, uh, what's the most effective? I, I think from phonolytics itself as well. Is it you know the animal cruelty? Is the environment the human health? And I think in those studies, um, yeah, I, I do see some variation in the conclusions of, of different studies. Um, but I think all seem to have some impact made with animal cruelty coming out a bit ahead. Uh, it's interesting that in our analysis, especially when we do this popularity-based filtering, it's actually human health that seems to be more represented. 
Um, so um, yeah, I think I think further um, methodological work on um, how can we kind of combine the the strengths of these two approaches is kind of observational naturalistic work where it's you know people just actually watching it in the wild like on Netflix on these streaming platforms um and these kind of these randomized controlled trials where of course there's always going to be selection bias of who even participates in these studies it's not quite a naturalistic setting um but but of course there you know we can actually have controls so i i think that you know um i think this question of how to synthesize the evidence um, and ultimately, uh, and uh, because I, I think it's an interesting question, like if we had sort of a Barbie or Oppenheimer level investment in a really great pro vegan media, what might happen? But of course, we need kind of, um, yeah, so it's a question of of how do we choose, you know, what content might actually go into to, to um, such a production um, and, and how we synthesize the evidence, um, both from observational studies like this and the RCTs that, that already exist. So I, th I think that's one is the methodological work and the um, data collection via, via possibly partnerships with uh, streaming companies. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so interesting to think about. Um, so that's all the time that we have for questions. Um, again, if you want to keep the discussion going, we will have a breakout room at the end of the session where all the speakers will be. So please join us there. So next up, we have Kathy Rogers, a research consultant at the Social Change Lab, who will present her research on social movement strategies and tactics. Hello, and thank you so much for having me at this really inspiring event. I'm going to be talking about the results of a recent expert survey we did on protest movements. But briefly first to introduce our organisation. Social Change Lab is a non-profit that conducts and disseminates social movement research, focusing mainly on the climate crisis and the animal advocacy movement. And we were funded because we think not enough research has gone on into social movements and how they impact the world, despite their crucial role in historical social change. So we try and fill that gap. We do research, we conduct trainings and um, other programs that can provide hopefully actionable, useful guidance to activists, campaigners and funders. So. To the work that I'm going to be talking about today, we surveyed 120 academic experts whose research focuses on social movements. We selected key editors and uh, editors and board members of some of the key academic journals and researchers whose work has had a high number of citations. Um, we had responses from experts in 25 different countries, all continents, but the majority were from the US and the UK. Um, mostly more than two thirds were of associate professor level and higher. And their main academic subjects were sociology and political science. And what we asked them about, so all of them answered general questions about what makes social movements succeed or fail to meet their goals. Uh, we asked about the use of specific tactics such as nonviolent disruption and we asked about the effectiveness of targeting uh, different stakeholders. Then a smaller group of experts, so 42, answered questions specifically focused on the animal advocacy movement. So first I'll talk about some of the main findings from the general part of the survey. So that this is when we were asking about social and protest movements in general, rather than about the animal movement specifically. So firstly, on disruption, over two thirds of experts said that the strategic use of disruptive tactics was quite or very important in contribu contributing to a movement's success. So if we look here, 69% of experts uh, rated this as uh, an important factor. In fact, the most important factor of the various options that we gave them about um, contributors to success. They thought that the effectiveness of disruptive tactics depends a lot on how the public feels about an issue to begin with. For example, for issues such as climate change that have high public awareness and support, 70% of experts thought that disruptive tactics were effective. Whereas for issues such as animal advocacy with low public awareness and support, only 47% thought that disruptive tactics were, were effective. 
Um, the view that disruption can be effective at all is in contrast with the public and media view, uh, which often believes that disruption is very counterproductive. So a recent YouGov poll in the UK found that 78% of, of the British public think that disruptive protest hinders the cause. Whereas our experts felt things more like this quote, which um, with the, without disruption, nothing changes. So in all instance, creating disruption is in some ways necessary. Um, we asked experts to rate the importance of a range of organisational factors that might influence the success of a movement. They thought the most important was the ability to mobilise and respond and scale quickly in response to external events, as obviously we saw with the Black Lives Matter movement um, a couple of years ago. Decentralised decision making was thought to be the least important factor. So here we can see 81% thought that mobilising and scaling quickly was important, whereas just 25% thought that decentralised decision making was. We also asked about uh, factors that might threaten the success of a movement. And here the experts thought that the most the most important factors were conflict, internal conflict or infighting and a lack of clear political objectives. And finally, we asked experts their views on what had been the most successful social movement of the last 20 years and the two clearly most cited were the LGBTQ plus movement, which was named by 20% of respondents, and the Black Lives Matter movement, which was named by 17%. So as I mentioned, fewer respondents have specific knowledge of the animal advocacy movement. So this next set of questions was optional. We only wanted those with expertise to answer it. We didn't want people just kind of having a guess. So 42 experts answered this set of questions. Again, we were interested in what experts thought about the use of different protest tactics. And given the animal advocacy movement is less well known than movements like the climate movement, we were surprised at how highly experts rated the likely positive effects of animal protests. So 80% thought non-disruptive protests are effective for movement building, for improving public opinion and for gaining supportive media coverage. So when you look at the graph, bear in mind that mostly blue means mostly positive. For all the goals, apart from one, non-disruptive protests were considered more effective than disruptive protests for the animal advocacy movement. So if we look at those three goals where non-disruptive protests scored 80%, for disruptive protests, these numbers were 57% for movement building, 41% for improving public opinion and just 20% for gaining supportive media coverage. But the one thing that disruption is good for is getting people talking. So if we look at the graph again, 78% of experts thought that disruptive protest is effective for higher salience in public discourse, that is, getting the conversation started. Coming on to targets, experts believe that protests focused on direct targets are most effective. For example, 78% thought that targeting the government was at least somewhat effective, followed by 64% for targeting the animal agriculture industry. And these were both much higher than indirect targets. So 29% thought that targeting the public was at least somewhat effective and just 17% thought that targeting unrelated venues like sporting events was. And this profile of a strong preference for direct targets was very much uh, mirrored in earlier questions we'd asked about the climate movement. Uh, one expert commented that breaking or getting into farms and illegally taking photos of suffering animals seems to be a functioning disruptive tactic, whereas others, blockades or damaging property, not. We were also interested in, in possible negative effects of protests, and there are two main kinds. So a backfire effect is essentially a backward step, such as a reduction in public support or a reduced likelihood of a policy being implemented. And polarisation refers to an increase in highly contrasting opinions on an issue. 
Experts thought that the likelihood of backfire effects really depended on the nature of the protest, what tactics protesters use. So for violent animal advocacy protests, 88% of experts thought there would be a backfire effect. For disruptive protests, this number went down to 65%. And for non-disruptive protests, the number fell to just 5%. So very few thought that these kind of protests were likely to backfire. Uh, on polarisation, just under half felt that polarisation was unavoidable. And experts were very split over whether or not polarisation would be likely to hinder the movement's progress. So while just over half thought it would, others thought it could have the opposite effect. So one said polarisation of animal rights would actually increase support for the movement as people with leftist self-identities come to see the humane treatment of animals as part of their self-construction. And another said movements work because they polarise people and an issue. You have to make a choice. Do we do B or do we keep A? So to sum up, Non-violent disruptive protest is likely to be an effective strategic tactic, but works best for issues which already have high public support. For the animal advocacy movement, disruptive protest might be the best way to get an issue to get the issue talked about. For most goals, such as movement building, improving public opinion and getting positive media coverage, non-disruptive protests are more effective. Um, and protests on direct targets, the government, animal agriculture are more likely to be effective than those on indirect ones. And backfire is likely, but polarisation might not be a bad thing. So that's a super flyby of findings. You can see the full survey and all the data on our website. Uh, we also have a monthly newsletter, which you can sign up to using the QR code and Thank you very much. I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you for that great presentation, Kathy. Uh, so let's dive into some questions. I'm seeing a few here in the chat. So first we have a question from Mona who asks, uh, she's curious about why you decided to talk with experts directly versus doing a literature review. Um, OK, thanks. Um, so we have done literature reviews to uh, dig into sort of specific evidence on particular aspects of effectiveness. So how protests affect public opinion or public discourse or um, policy um, implementation or you know, more direct effects. But I think the goal here was to try and collate um, a sort of consensus view amongst experts who spend their lives studying this. Um, for the animal advocacy, it's less true to say that because obviously 42 is not a huge number, but there probably aren't that many academics who specialise on this particular thing. But that was our goal was to, to try and get an idea of what experts as a group think about certain kind of tactics and strategies and approaches. But definitely, you know, it's something, you know, it's no single piece of evidence is going to give you the whole story. So, you know, we definitely see this as something to look at alongside experimental work and literature reviews and all sorts of other evidence. Great. Um, I see a pretty interesting question here from Serenity. Um, how important is the fostering of safe and inclusive communities within justice movements, including having clear and extensive policies on addressing harassment, discrimination, et cetera, within a group? Well, thank you, Serenity. It's a really great question and very, very pertinent, um, certainly in the UK at the moment, where there's all sorts of new bills around the uh, curtailing rights to protest and the issues are very different for protesting depending on what group you belong to, how you might be treated by police. So I think an it's an absolutely key part of training and movement organising is to, is to ensure that safe space is prioritised in protest. It's absolutely key to, to trust to continued mobilization, to attracting more people to a movement. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely essential. I mean, it's not something we asked about directly in this survey, but I think that, you know, it, it's it's some future work that we have planned to look at the effect of some of the new um, sort of like um, 
constraints on protest and what effect that has on mobilization and people sort of feeling able to go out on the streets and how that might differentiate according to sort of like different um, characteristics that people have. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. That's all the time that we have for questions. Um, but again, we can continue the discussion in the breakout rooms once the session is over. So the last speaker in this session is Jennifer Channing, the Executive Director of Better Food Foundation, who will discuss the impact of serving plant-based dishes as a default option within dining hall stations at different universities. Hello, my name is Jennifer Channon. I am the Executive Director of the Better Food Foundation, and I'm very happy to be presenting the results of a research study that we were a part of this fall called Serving Up Plants by Default. This study was uh, done in partnership with several organizations. The Better Food Foundation commissioned the study and was involved in the research design and implementation. Uh, but the project was led by an organization called the Food for Climate League. We also partnered with SIDEXO, which is the food service operator at the three universities where the study took place. Uh, and Dr. Greg Sparkman of Boston College, who's going to be publishing a paper that includes the full data from the study uh, later this year. We also want to thank Tulane, Lehigh, and Rensselaer Universities for participating and also for Veg Fund for supporting the project. So this study was to measure the effectiveness of using plant-based defaults in university dining halls, and particularly in all-you-can-eat dining settings. And this is the first study that studied plant-based defaults in that type of environment. I'll start by explaining what defaults are. Defaults are a type of behavioral nudge that makes the desired choice the easy choice. Defaults gently guide a person to take on a desired behavior by presenting them with a predetermined option that takes effect if that person does not seek out another option. For example, if you don't check the box that says vegetarian option or vegan option, you will automatically get a meal that has animal products in it because they are the default. There's several benefits of using plant-based defaults as a strategy for changing diets in a plant-based direction. One of them is that multiple studies have found that it dramatically increases the uptake of plant-based foods, typically by more than 50%. Plant-based defaults also minimize pushback from diners and institutions because the option to choose animal products is still available to people. Another benefit is that this approach frames plant-based foods positively as the norm, rather than as a sacrifice that diners need to make. And finally, we're excited about this strategy because it's a strategy that is easy for activists and volunteers, such as college students, uh, to, to use in whatever settings they're a part of. It's an easy ask for them to make because of its positive framing. We wanted this study to take place in particular because of gaps that exist in existing research uh, into plant-based defaults. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is the first time that this approach has been studied in all-you-can-eat dining halls, which is the most common way that food is served on college campuses. Second, we wanted there to be a study that tested plant-based defaults. Uh, whereas most of the studies that have been done previously used vegetarian as the default or no red meat as the default, we wanted to see what would happen if we made vegan food the default. And finally, we wanted the study to capture information about the ease of implementation, cost, and diner satisfaction, since we know these are factors that institutions care about when they're making dining decisions. Furthermore, we knew that if this strategy was a successfully implemented at uh, universities widely, it would impact a huge number of students and a huge number of meals. So here's what we did. In fall of 2022, Food for Climate League conducted a randomized control trial over five weeks, and we did this at three universities, Tulane University, Lehigh University, and Rensselaer. Um, during each study lunch period, uh, they were randomly assigned to serve one of eight pairs of dishes, and each pair contained 
both either a plant-based dish or a meat dish and was randomly assigned that dish uh, during, during those five weeks. Um, on plant default days, only a plant-based dish was presented, but there was a sign informing students that they could ask the serving staff for the meat version if the dish was desired. And on control days, both the meat and plant-based dishes were presented side by side at the station. So this is what that presentation looked like on a plant default day. The meals that are presented are plant-based. There are meals with animal proteins, but they are behind the, the table and students need to request them and that there's a sign letting students know that those options are available. We collected both quantitative and qualitative data during the study. Uh, the qualitative data involved uh, 52 staff survey responses, nine post-study interviews, and 211 student survey responses. So I'm going to list what our five key findings were from the study and give some explanation. The first is that when implemented consistently, plant-based defaults increase the selection of plant-based dishes and decrease the selection of meat dishes. And this has a result in reducing the food-related greenhouse gas emissions of the food served. So at the three universities on average, on control days, only 26.9% of dishes served were plant-based. In comparison, on plant default days, 57.6% of dishes were served were plant-based. However, we saw an even more pronounced increase at two of the universities, Tulane and Lehigh, that saw an increase from 30.8% on control days to 81.5% on plant-based default days. And we estimate that uh, food-related greenhouse gas emissions across all three colleges uh, declined by 23.6% on plant default days at these stations. Our second key finding uh, is uh, showed that with incorrect implementation, the impact of the default on dish choice vanished. So we wanted to understand why the impact was so much more pronounced at Lehigh uh, and at Tulane than it was at Rensselaer. Uh, and at Rensselaer, there really wasn't much of a difference uh, between the, the control and the plant-based days. And what our research assistants told us is that at Rensselaer, there were implementation inconsistencies that included incorrectly arranging the dishes so that when students lined up, they actually did see the meat dishes available when they weren't supposed to, inconsistent display of signage, and serving staff who uh, weren't really trained in how to talk about the study. So they were doing things like encouraging students uh, verbally to pick the meat-based meals. Um, this was exacerbated by understaffing and rotation of staff. Um, and another factor that seemed to be at play is that Rensselaer's student body is 69% male, uh, whereas the student bodies at Lehigh and Tulane were uh, either more even or predominantly female. And this aligns with our survey responses that showed that male students were uh, generally less enthusiastic about choosing plant-based options. Our third key finding is that students, including meat eaters, are open to plant-based options. On average, there was no statistical difference in student satisfaction between plant-based and meat dishes. But what we found most interesting is that on the plant default days, students showed higher satisfaction in plant-based dishes than they showed in those same dishes on a control day. That is, serving plant-based meals as the default made students more satisfied with those meals than if they weren't presented as the default. We also learned that students expressed a higher satisfaction rating for processed plant-based dishes compared to both meat dishes and whole plant-based dishes. So, so uh, you know, the least popular dishes were whole food plant-based dishes. Uh, after that, meat dishes were next most popular, but in fact, the most popular dishes overall were processed plant-based dishes. Uh, we also learned that female students expressed higher satisfaction with plant-based dishes overall than male students. And this was even more pronounced at Tulane and Lehigh, where the female student body was larger. Our fourth key finding was that dining hall staff found the plant-based default easy and enjoyable to 
implement. And in fact, at two universities, they reported that it was easier to implement than other kinds of plant-based initiatives they had attempted previously. And finally, our fifth key finding is that eating and serving meat continues to be the social norm in campus dining. So 43.1% of students reported consuming seven or more servings of meat per week, whereas only 5.2% reported consuming plant-based proteins at that same frequency. We found that women expressed a greater openness to adopting plant-based proteins and also a stronger desire to increase consumption of fruits and vegetables. And we did observe that there was a spillover effect of uh, students not choosing this station and instead going to other stations where there were meat options available. So in summary, we learned that plant-based defaults are in fact a good strategy to nudge diners towards plant-based meals in this kind of university dining setting. However, proper implementation is key to success. We learned that students and staff at these kinds of university dining settings are open to plant-based cuisines, but that it's helpful to partner with food service leaders in order to overcome challenges to implementation. Thank you for listening to my presentation. You can download the complete executive summary report at www.betterfoodfoundation.org. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful presentation, Jennifer. Um, we are now joined by Jacina Beckert, who is part of the research team with Jennifer. Uh, so she'll be here uh, for the Q&A. So let's check out these questions. <clears throat> All right, we have one here asking, um, phrasing is interesting again, was animal protein, which sounds kind of healthy and positive, chosen for any particular reason? In a conversation recently, the phrase legacy meat came up. Mm, interesting question. Thank you. Um, we as a research team actually discussed how we frame this option pretty in depth. And I don't think there is a one size fits all solution. And I think next time we could try a different version. We wanted to emphasize that there is protein in the meal already. So even if people don't see, like we know that people often have a tendency to think they can only get their protein through animal um, consumption. And people often, especially students, think they, they need protein um, to get through the day, to feel nourished, to feel strong. So we wanted to say that there is protein in this and that there is an alternative. So we discussed using the term alternative protein. Um, we wanted to have the term protein in there and and eventually landed at animal protein but would be open to to shift that again uh, we didn't think it would be such a positive connotation but i could see i could see that interpretation being true as well but we did have a a, a lengthy conversation about how to frame it great thanks um so we have a question here from sarah says, I'm curious if there was any possibility that students that preferred meat responded to this by just eating elsewhere. So uh, in a dining hall that wasn't uh, doing the experiment rather than eating the plant-based option. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Jennifer alluded to this um, when she was talking about the spillover effect. So we did look at what were the other options that were provided. We only looked at the same dining hall then though. Um, so we don't know if people left this dining hall to go to another one, but we did look at what other options and what type of animal meat um, options were provided at the other stations. And we did see um, some spillover effect of students consuming at other stations, but then overall looking at the cafeteria, we still saw that increase of plant-based meats, but absolutely some students went, saw this, didn't see, maybe didn't see the sign, just saw that there was a plant-based option and went over to another station, which is why we're hoping to run another study um, that is going to be taking over multiple station in the same cafeteria and potentially then even looking at different sites. But the next, um, the, the immediate next step would be looking at doing a default in several stations in the same cafeteria. Awesome. 
Very interesting. Well, uh, thank you so much for answering our questions. Um, that concludes our second session of the day. So for continued discussions on any of these topics, please click on the pop-up window that uh, will invite you to the breakout rooms where all five speakers will be. Um, so if you wanted to ask a question but didn't get a chance to do so, please go into this breakout room. Uh, the next session, examining methods of exploitation, will start at 3.10 p.m. Eastern. So see you then.